Well, let me get a little bit of a setting for us today, and we'll get a set of what we want to cover, and we're hoping to be uh, uh, in addition to uh, other parts of the program that you've been able to attend, and uh, hopefully there's been something you've seen in the description of this session that, uh, that fits for you. But let me give you a little bit of a journey, at least my journey, of, of how I find myself to be here and, and, and why I would be in a program like this. Uh, I'd, in some ways, I'd like to tell you this story about last Saturday. As, as excited as I am to be a part of uh, this conference this Saturday, uh, last Saturday was even a little bit more exciting because uh, uh, my friend uh, Clay Olson and I uh, presented on the harms of pornography to uh, the entire uh, Kansas City Royals organization at their spring training. So. Uh, no offense, uh, this, this is cool and fun, but uh, Kansas City Royal Spring Training was really cool and really fun. Uh, so what's the journey? How do I end up in places like that and places like this? Um, I never set out to be a pornography researcher. It was never an intent or pattern of mine. In fact, it's still not even necessarily the primary area of my work. Uh, but here's where the journey begins. Uh, I've been doing research in relationships, particularly relationships of uh, young adults. Uh, no surprise to anybody, right? We've noticed a trend in our culture and society today of, uh, of an extended period of single adulthood, uh, what scholars are calling emerging adulthood. And so what I largely study is the patterns and trends of emerging adulthood, and in particular, how those trends influence readiness for later relationships, particularly marriage and family relationships, and how are there ways that we see uh, young people flourishing and flounder floundering during their young adult years uh, that impacts those later relationships. That's really what I do and is the focus of my work. Oh, about 2005, uh, a couple of colleagues and myself, we launched a study in a project uh, that was later termed Project Ready uh, and we did a national survey and sample of, of young adults uh, to study a variety of factors. In that study, we put two questions. A frequency question about how frequently they were using pornography and an attitude question, how acceptable do you think it is to use pornography, okay? With that, those two items, I later uh, did a study and published a study that came out in 2008 entitled Generation XXX and looked at pornography patterns related to other parts of young adulthood. Now remember, big study looking at young adults, two questions. Three weeks after that study published, and I was fielding calls from Australia, and from Saudi Arabia, and from other parts of the globe, I thought, uh, something's going on here, we've got something. Uh, Really, the reality is, is a testament to how thin the research base was 10 years ago. There was some research, but not as much uh, as we see now and as much as we still need to see occur. But from that, uh, our team and our lab uh, in our relationship studies have continued to always add more and more of some pornography content to that. And of course, we've started to connect and get involved with the other labs uh, that are doing relationship research connected to pornography. So that is how a relationship researcher, a marriage researcher, ends up uh, often uh, uh, asked to be uh, and present uh, as a pornography researcher. So uh, why do I give you that background? That gives us a sense of a foundation of what I'm hoping for us to do today and also for some of the information that I'd like to share with you. When we talked a little bit about how to fit and add to this year's UCAP program, we thought that it might be a good idea. Uh, your experience may be similar to mine in that we have a, a lot of talk and a lot of awareness starting to grow around pornography. And often that talk is centered around and emphasizes addiction, right? And I'm sure you've seen today and you've been a part of presentations and even before coming today, recognizing the importance and significance uh, of, of what can happen when pornography patterns become habitual, become compulsive, and become addictive. But at the same time, there's also some errors. There's some risks that can come if we exclusively or solely approach pornography from an addiction lens. Okay, two errors that are pretty common. And I apologize, with our setup in this room, uh, I think we've set you up for a nice tennis match. 
Uh, I think you're going to be in this kind of pattern of, you know, ding, ding, ding. So if I could turn this nice little screen right here, I'd just invite you all up, and we could all kind of sit in the first 10 rows and, and, and watch our screen together. So uh, sorry about the, 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 the tennis match. Uh, no, no offense as you all look away and go the other direction. The, slide, the slides will be better. What's one of the errors? One of the errors is an assumption of addiction, okay? Many people are equating all pornography use with addiction, and if behavior is incorrectly classified as an addiction, one of the main results of this is the user and others may think that he or she has lost agency and the capacity to overcome the problem, right? So our purpose today isn't to talk about this primary error, but I wanted to mention it and highlight it. It does become important for us, right? Elder Dallin H. Oaks, in addressing uh, members of the LDS Church, uh, wrote an article back in 2015 uh, emphasizing the same pattern and, 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 and the same error and cautioning about an over-assumption of, right, that a pattern is automatically addictive, even when it's been habitual or it's quite intensive. Uh, doesn't necessarily always mean that it's hitting that threshold or that pattern. Now, again, and to be absolutely clear, that doesn't mean there is clearly in the spectrum times when it does become compulsive and addictive. But the other error, and this is where we're going to focus our attention today, is a pattern that we can often see then if addiction is overemphasized, there becomes a minimization of the harms of non-compulsive use, right? What often happens, particularly for young people, is that this becomes the moderation argument. Oh, okay, so as long as someone doesn't get hooked, as long as someone doesn't get addicted to, as long as someone doesn't get out of control with, then a little bit of pornography use, right, or some uh, 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 smaller habit use, right, that's not going to create a problem. And so we get many people now that are talking in that way and emphasizing that type of direction is that ultimately uh, it's only when it's frequent, only when it's addictive, okay? So our hope today with this session and this discussion is to uh, present some ideas and some ways to think about and you'll see that I'm going to emphasize also ways to teach about. I think mostly our young people, uh, teens and young adults and others are particularly susceptible uh, to some of these errors of thinking. And how do we counteract that? And how do we approach this in a way uh, that we recognize the harms of pornography even when it doesn't reach a compulsive or addictive pattern? Okay. So let's uh, take a look then. Needed foundation, and this is in some ways is my, 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 my main message for today is actually on this slide, right? There's a needed foundation to begin to talk about the harms of pornography even prior to an addictive pattern really comes from us being able to teach and talk and think about pornography as it really is. And to be careful about the justifications and the rationale that we see many make as they try to emphasize pornography as harmless, right? And again, maybe they'll go to the idea of saying, well, addiction's pretty extreme, not everybody becomes an addict, right? One of the key foundations for us to understand and to teach is to capture that pornography by its very nature is sexual fragmentation, okay? There is no way for us to ever escape that reality. It fragments, it does not connect us to or connect anyone to individuals as whole people, okay? So emphasizing this the idea, and I'm sure you've heard this and you've seen this, right, connected to uh, uh, the other presentations that you've seen. But we're going to talk a little bit more about what sexual fragmentation is and see how it stands in contrast to an idea that we'll talk about as sexual wholeness. And in fact, this becomes one of the key notions and ideas for us, right? That an understanding of sexual wholeness is needed, one of the biggest mistakes I think we're making at times is that our young people are being talked to about pornography like it's a separate issue. It's a separate thing to avoid. It's disconnected from conversations about sexuality, conversations about relationships in ways that gives them a fuller understanding. One of the best ways that you and I can test ourselves to see if we're doing this type of education well with those in our circles of influence starting in our own hearts and our own homes and then in our other areas of influence is, do the people we teach, and maybe even asking the question first and foremost of ourselves, do you have something to stand for? 
If someone can articulate what they are standing for, then that means they have to understand what healthy sexuality is. And they're better able to contrast then what pornography is not. But when we don't embed this in a broader, fuller conversation of healthy sexuality and preparation for relationships and understandings around this, pornography gets disconnected and it becomes something that's not tied together. And for many, it starts to sound like they're simply standing against something. And more and more, particularly for the rising generation, they're not overly comfortable standing against things. But if you help them understand, no, 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 this is about standing for something, okay? I put here on this slide, and these slides will be connected to the presentation as it gets posted later. Uh, my colleagues and I have actually published a book called Sexual Wholeness in Marriage. We use it in our classes down on campus at BYU in the marriage preparation course in our healthy sexuality class uh, to give a foundation and a base uh, for teaching and thinking about. We think it's a helpful tool for young adults, uh, for, for engaged and dating couples, uh, uh, married couples as well. It's really about principles of healthy relationships and healthy sexuality, so couples and individuals can pull it into their individual places. So I'll share with you some ideas here in a minute of what I think are part of the, the key ideas. But again, the whole idea here is if we don't have a vision of sexual wholeness, it's very hard for us then to have a sense of what are the potential harms of pornography particularly if it's not reaching an addictive or compulsive level. And I would also just give us one more uh, on this idea, is that I actually believe that if we don't integrate our cautions and warnings about pornography into a fuller, broader cultural conversation and family conversations around healthy sexuality, we actually have the risk of doing some harm. Because what ends up happening oftentimes is without those deeper understandings, it can lead to not only negative views of pornography, but pornography often gets equated to sexuality. And then there's negative views of sexuality, and what ends up often happening is at best, we change one problem for another. So even if that is somehow helpful in keeping young people and teens away from engaging in pornography, if the cost of that is they've now internalized negative messages of sexuality, uh, many of us in the counseling circles around will see that there's a portion of our couples that are transitioning to marriage and are struggling with a sense of rightness and appropriateness and, and education and understanding and confidence about this part of their relationship. So really, in many ways, this becomes key. The more we teach what should be, we're better able to capture an understanding of, of some of these risks and some of these patterns. So where does this go? First off, it's about deepening our understanding of the human capacity for intimacy, which, of course, this stands in deep contrast to pornography that tries to move it to a very different type of understanding and symbolism. I've always been a, a, a deep admirer of the work of David Schnarch. Uh, Dr. Schnarch is one of our leading uh, sex experts in, in our culture and in our society, particularly in the areas of sex therapy and couples counseling around intimacy issues. He's deeply criticized that we currently have a modern and pattern, even in counseling circles and definitely in our medical circles, that we have moved to this, what he calls naturalization or medicalization of human sexuality. And the early models that came out that guided sex therapy and sex education were largely based on just a biological and understanding of the human response. So some of you can even think back to that, right? You probably think back to high school health classes or other times and the human sexual response cycle and it moves us through, right, the anatomy and the physiological response. There's some utility and there's some value in understanding that. It's not that those, those models are factually inaccurate. They're just woefully incomplete. And so as Dr. Snarsh would point out to us, he says, current models of human sexuality have failed to account for the characteristic which most sets human sexuality apart from that of other species, the human capacity for intimacy and attaching profound emotional meaning to sexual experience. We have to recognize and understand that as we teach about pornography and as we stand against pornography at its core, we are also fundamentally standing for a paradigm of human sexuality, one that is about whole people, one that is about deep emotional meaning, one that is about connecting symbols, right, that tie this to 
those aspects of deep and full relationships. That's a, starting to get the essence and concept of what we mean by the term wholeness as opposed to sexual fragmentation where all that is known is physical or is related to in those ways. When we talk about this as well, it's important for us to emphasize that the human sexual nature is much more than just our physiology. It's much more than just our biology, right? So as we teach about, particularly and talk to young people about sexual wholeness, it's helpful for them to understand that this comprises different parts of themselves and different parts of their nature. So for example, we talk about there being a meaning dimension, right? That we have this ability, we are meaning-making creatures. We want to understand and to have purpose for this. I tease my students in class, this is why they always come home from dates, trying to interpret, right, what happened or didn't happen, what occurred in those settings, and then they sit with their roommates long into the night asking the question, what did that mean, right? I got the post-date text, I didn't get the post-date text, right? Held my hand, didn't hold my hand, what did that mean? Why do we care so much what it means? Because we're meaning-making creatures, and we attach deep meaning, and we have the potential to attach deep meaning to these types of experiences. So that's a part of ourselves, and for many people, they tie this to their values, they tie this to their sense of spirituality, to their sense of purpose and direction in life would tie to this meaning dimension. We also emphasize and talk about this emotional dimension that's a part of our nature. Right? As we think about these patterns of romantic love and, and bonding with someone, right? most of us it doesn't take very long to realize that there's a different type of love. Right? It's wonderful to be loved by our mother, to be loved by our families, right? but we start to realize that there's a type of love and bond and connection that even the most dearest devoted mother cannot give us. Right? And it's connected to that romantic loving part of ourselves. Right? The evolutionary psychologist would say that we are pair bonding creatures. We are hardwired to connect. It is a part of who we are, is this desire to bond. So again, there's deep emotional uh, connection to this that's a part of who we are. We either live in harmony with this or we deny this and betray this in the way that we approach relationships and the way we express ourselves as sexual beings. And then we always want to help young people understand too that there's a physical dimension and that their bodies and the way their bodies are designed and the way their bodies function have tremendous capacity and potential for sexual arousal and sexual response, right? And recognizing the goodness and the rightness and the appropriateness of this in its intentions in this way that brings us together in this wholeness of relationships. And of course, creates the possibilities and patterns of love and marriage and family and these types of things. So all of this has to be integrated, right? So why am I sharing you with you these dimensions? As, I, as we have these dimensions, we're able to start having a deeper, richer, fuller discussion of what it means to be sexual and whether or not it is a whole version of sexuality or whether or not it is a fragmented, impartial version of sexuality. So we often will emphasize and talk about ideas of levels of and different types of of parts of relationships to have to be integrated. The physical and the emotional, of course, has to be connected. If you don't know someone emotionally, right, and all you know of them is either watching them or interacting with them physically, that's fragmented, right? If you don't know the person, if there's no way to be emotionally bound and connected, Permanence and commitment in relationships becomes tremendously important as well because it's in that commitment context that we see people ultimately unifying not only for an experience and not only for a relationship, but for their lives. That gives an opportunity for there to be deeper, fuller meaning tied to that type of bonding and that type of connection. And an integration of this with our meaning and our values. People have very different experiences, and we don't have time today to go into the depth of the research available to us, but very different experiences when they live according to their values in the way that they express themselves sexually or when they live contrary to those values and they start to experience the dissidence and the disconnect and the difficulty of life when they see themselves betraying things that they otherwise value and have meaning for them. Which of course, as, you, as we look at patterns that do become compulsive and addictive, that's one of the biggest areas of torment that they create, right? It's a cyclical pattern of turning away from 
the very things that we value and care for, but we've got it in, into this pattern and difficulty. But we can do it in other ways too. It's not just addiction and compulsion where we can live in harmony with those values. So see, see these levels? It's ultimately about connecting a spirit and a body, right? It's about connecting a husband and a wife, and it's about connecting a relationship to deep meaning. And for many couples, that deep meaning is spiritual meaning. And it ties them to a sense of purpose. It ties them to a sense of a larger uh, uh, plan and direction and meaning to what their life is about. So there's all of these ways. This is what Dr. Schnarch meant when he talked about our unique capacity as humans to instill this deep type of meaning. Okay? So that's a very quick uh, uh, wild to you know, Mr. Toad's wild ride uh, 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 primer on sexual wholeness and, and healthy sexuality. And I'll defer you to the sexual wholeness book and to other sources for deepening, but even with those beginning understandings and that ability to talk, uh, we can start to talk about pornography in some very different ways. And we can start to see how even casual, minimal patterns with pornography create threats and create risks to relationships. Okay? So I'm going to focus on, in particular, we're going to talk about the emotional and physical bonds in a relationship. As people come together in a dating process, come together in a courtship process, and definitely as they uh, maybe extend that into the deeper commitments of, of, of a marriage and a lifelong type relationship. So our working definition here with getting our, our mind around these bonds is that for this to be successful, for this to be at its hold, for this to be all that it can be, sexual wholeness involves whole person love, where we see and treat each other as feeling, thinking, acting persons. When you touch a body, you touch a whole person, their mind, their spirit, and their emotions. And each of us can reflect, is this how we learned about sexuality? Is this how it was talked about to us? Is this how we teach and talk about it? Do we have an ability in the openness of dialogue and discussion to create this type of vision, this type of view? Or do we even in other times, not just with pornography, but in other conversations, do we just become behavioral, right? Anybody been in those types of lessons? I've been in lessons in school. I've been in lessons in church, right? Uh, I don't even want to get you thinking about, like, think of the, the modesty lessons you're aware of, right? Is there any example of a more behavioral approach to teaching about something that ties to sexuality? Next thing you know, we're talking about just simply the, the length of clothing or the behavior of some sort of pattern that's rarely tied back into deeper, fuller meaning understand, and understandings. And we're doing this a lot with pornography as well. So even with this, we can start to talk about. So let's talk about this emotional bond. And I want to share some research with you. I want to get into some of the studies as well, because I think most of us are anxious to be able to talk about this in multiple settings. It's one thing inside of our own hearts and our own homes to talk about this inside of our value language or maybe our faith language. Uh, but it's also very helpful to know, how do I talk about this with people who don't share those values? Is that, is that the end of the conversation? We can only preach to the choir, so to speak. Or is there evidence and understanding that goes well beyond that? And so I'm going I'm to rely pretty heavily here on some research studies, and I want see to see some of the evidences. But of course, what we're trying to help appreciate, right, is that emotional bond has to be about the love and the trust in a relationship. Any patterns that start to threaten either the full development of trust and love or start to betray the sense of trust and love in a relationship. And it doesn't matter if it is a complete shattering of that or if it's something that even starts to create doubts and questions about that. It starts to erode the relationship, right? So we can talk about, in the attachment literature, we talk about the difference between attachment threats and attachment injuries in a relationship and to the attachment bond. We don't have to wait until something's become an attachment injury to say this is doing harm. Anything that starts to become even an attachment threat, right, that causes us to doubt, to wonder, to, to start to have those types of interactions. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, and then we'll talk a bit about the physical bond, which in a romantic context ties us to anything that can impact or influence attraction and devotion. 
So anything that minimizes the sense of attraction between partners and between spouses in a marriage context. And then devotion. Devotion being the idea of attraction to a particular person, right? The idea of, of, of exclusiveness and devotion, which becomes critical. And for the vast majority of people in our culture, still continues to be what they envision, what they hope for, and what they want to experience in a, a marriage relationship and in that type of pattern. So first off, the emotional bond. And this isn't going to be revolutionary to anybody, but what is it that often most erodes trust? Secrets. Secrets around trust, right? Things that are kept from behind. So here's a great example that even if pornography is quite minimal in somebody's life, if it's done in a secretive, hidden way, it creates a risk to a relationship, right? Secrets damage trust. There's an entire literature that's coming, right? Studies in a variety of areas that look at what's called personal concealment. Okay? And this can be anything. This can be any behavior. So personal concealment is when people do things they're not proud of and they keep them secret from their friends and family members. The research compellingly shows us when people do this, it not only hurts their relationships, it leaves them feeling lonely and it makes them more vulnerable to depression, poor self-esteem, and anxiety. Right? So we definitely could see this pattern in pornography. We see this pattern with people struggling with eating disorders. We see this with people struggling with gambling issues that they hide and try to keep away. Any type of pattern that we can see that occurring, right? So here's an example that even if someone says, I have no values against pornography, I don't think anything's morally right or wrong about it, right? This basic pattern that we see is so common. Right? And people say, well, this is going away, right? People are being more honest with each other. People are just open about this. So what you're telling me is just as long as couples are honest, this isn't going to be a factor. Well, the problem is, is we have a tremendous gap in pornography in our culture. My colleagues and I just published a study back in May of 2017 entitled The Porn Gap, where we examined extensively the differences between men and women in their use of pornography inside of couple relationships. But we also had the unique ability because we had matched couple data. So what that meant is we were able to actually take couples where we had the husband and the wife and ask them, how much are you viewing pornography? And then we'd ask the partner, how much do you think he's viewing pornography? And then we were able to connect that data to say, well, how accurate are those understandings? What I've put up on the slide right now is a table, right, that comes from this. And I've also shown at the bottom of this, uh, there's a website for you at the Institute of Family Studies, uh, ifsstudies.org. Uh, uh, Brad Wilcox and his group, uh, we did a, a brief on this, kind of more for a general audience rather than the full research article. So if you want to go read the whole piece, you can go to ifsstudies.org uh, and, and see this study called The Porn Gap. But what this graph shows you right here is his use and whether it's known or not known. So we're mapping two pieces of information here. One is the husbands, right, which is in the blue lines reporting how much they view pornography, right, and the frequency level of that. The brownish toned lines, the tan lines, are actually representing the report from the wife and the partner in that relationship. How much do you think he's doing pornography? Okay. As we calculate that, what we find out is that there's only a 46% correct response rate in this sample. Okay. Only less than half of the wives are actually correctly reporting the amount of pornography use that the husband has. 37% of the situations, the husband is actually using more, and in a number of those cases, significantly more right, than the partner understands or knows. In another portion that's not on the graph, when we asked people in casual dating relationships, we didn't just look at marriages, we actually looked at casual dating, and this sample we had was over 20,000 people across the country. This is a large national data set. We asked men and women, so this wasn't paired data, but we asked men and women in casually dating relationships, how much do you think your partner is using pornography, right? The women in casually dating relationships, 0%, 0 of the women said that my partner is using pornography 
every day or every other day. Guess what percent of the men in casually dating relationships said they were using pornography every day or every other day? 38%. So here the partners are saying, oh, nope, zero, right? And we've got nearly 40% of the men saying that they're at that level. So the gap is even bigger in dating relationships. The awareness gets a little bit better as we move forward, but there still tends to be this huge pattern. It's very common that pornography concealment is probably the biggest pattern we have in this secrecy in relationships and the way that it erodes, right? The love and the trust in those patterns. Anything we do, right? So this becomes key. And this is one that we can teach to children and young people in a lot of parts of life. Even when we're not directly talking about pornography. Teaching young people to be authentic, honest people. To avoid having a private public split in the way they live. But I'll tell you what, for all the parents in the room, and as a, as a father of five kids, and ranging from 12 to 24 these days, you got to be careful with that one too, right? Because you better be able to... Practice what you preach, right? The last thing to do is to tell children to live that authentic life. And if they get some glimpse into our private life and they find out, we don't do that. But that becomes the commitment, right? To move away from personal concealment, but to move to a pattern of personal honesty, to actually live according to those values that we privately espouse. This is something I see in my counseling work. It's something I see in my education work, in my counseling with students. I see a lot of couples that when pornography use isn't anywhere near an addiction or a compulsion level, but the secrecy, the privacy, and the hidden pattern of it is what is most tearing that relationship apart. So it's a great example. It's a great way for us to think about that pornography doesn't need to be addictive for it to become this type of pattern and problem. Let's talk a little bit more about the physical bond and talk about the sexual fragmentation that happens in relationships. This probably won't be news to you. It's probably now by the time you, you go is the, 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 the later presentations in the day, you start to say, okay, now I'm gonna start you know, checking the old, how many times have I heard the word objectification box, right? So I, I won't be surprised if this isn't your first introduction to objectification today. But it's a meaningful one for us to really think about and to digest. Right? Again, this is getting us back to the very nature of pornography. It is impossible, impossible for anyone to argue or state otherwise that pornography is not a form of sexual fragmentation that includes objectification. There is no way to know a person in a whole, full, deep way. It is by its definition, right, encouraging these types of patterns of objectification that gets us thinking about and looking at and paying attention to a person's body parts, right? Thinking about others as a tool, right, or an object that meets our own personal good or pleasures. Seeing others as replaceable. Oh my goodness, even in the ethics, if you will, the morality of pornography, how replaceable are people? Right? You could literally go back and even the images that are being digested, some of them don't even get to be viewed for a nanosecond. It's so replaceable. It's always the next page. It's always the next image. It's always the next video. Right? We literally turn people and their bodies into a catalog. And as we do that, we lose the depth and essence of humanity, of who all those people are, what their names are, what their thoughts are, what they like, what they don't like, right? What's going well in their life, what's not going well in their life, right? The relationships they have with family and friends and all of these people. The very nature of pornography is objectification. And it often does teach us that it's okay to hurt and mistreat others, right? And this last one here, believe that there's no need to worry about the preferences and feelings of other people. This is one also that goes beyond just sexuality and pornography, right? Each one of us needs to be deeply involved in teaching our children about the meaning and value of people and to live in ways that we consider their preferences, we consider their wants and their desires as well, and to live in a way that we do this, not simply in a selfish type pattern that seeks after our own interests and our own patterns. And pornography in many ways gives the illusion of relationship, but one of the most damaging parts of it is 
we're completely in control as the viewer of pornography. We are in control. We control other people. We invite them and dismiss them from the situation at our uh, desires. It's about what we want, when we want. The pattern becomes one that's completely self-serving and turning inward. Don't know if you're familiar with the beauty uh, redefined uh, movement, uh, but there's ways for us to connect to this. I think now is actually a time of opportunity for those that are worried about pornography, and it's a time for us to be more bold, and it's a time for us to raise our voices and get properly engaged. As we have a culture now with the Me Too movement, as we're recognizing the wrongs of the harassment and assault and all across the spectrum, I think it becomes a ready time for us to have the conversation about how massively inconsistent condoning pornography is in that conversation, right? And particularly as you go and listen to, to Dr. Fulbert this afternoon, uh, John will give us great information too about the content of that pornography and the ways that it in many ways is directly connected to assault and these types of patterns. So we see this and we see a pattern then as we start to objectify. None of us can live the lie that we can tell ourselves that somehow I can objectify here but then in my real relationships, I won't do the same, right? It becomes the way that we think. It becomes the way that we see people and approach this. Now, the difficulty, and part of what gets really scary here, is it gets even worse. Objectification by itself would be a, pa a problem, but objectification becomes particularly worse because now we're adding it to this context of unrealistic expectations, how many of you have had any exposure to and understand the work of doc, uh, Dr. Nicholas Timbergen? If you've seen the Fight the New Drug uh, presentations, you'll see that they tie into to Dr. Timbergen's work a little bit. Let me tell you about this a little bit, and uh, trust me, about halfway through what I'm describing to you here, you're going to have an aha moment. You're going to get it, okay? Dr. Timbergen was the 1973 winner of the Nobel Prize, okay? He's a biologist by training. And he studies attraction and instinct, okay? And so one of his studies in particular that pays attention to us here, he had the idea that would it be possible to create what he called a supranormal stimulus, okay? And he tested this in a lot of ways, but the most famous way he tested it was with butterflies. He noticed that with butterflies, that when it came to mating, the male butterflies are attracted to the designs and spot patterns on the wings of female butterflies. So he said, I'm going to see if you can create what he called this super normal stimulus. So he created cardboard butterflies. They were bigger. The colors were brighter, right? More pronounced of everything he'd learned about what were the attraction signals of the pairing and mating of butterflies, right? And then he did his experiment, and he put male and female butterflies together with his cardboard butterflies into an environment and watched what happened. And where did the male butterflies go? They all went to mate with the cardboard butterflies, completely ignoring the female butterflies in the environment. They all went to the cardboard butterfly. The supranormal, right, stimulus drew the instinct, drew the attraction, and that's where they went. Have they had the aha moment yet? Pornography is at its core a supranormal stimulus. Everything is exaggerated. Everything is fake. Everything is choreographed in ways that have some semblance to the natural cues of attraction and arousal, but it's all on steroids and hyper in the way that it's done. Everything done from the angles to the poses to the surgically altered bodies to the patterns of what is presented, right? I loved one of the comments that was made in our conversation last week down with the Royals. One of the old pitchers actually from the major league team got up because he wanted to teach the younger guys that this mattered. And his phrase to them was, it takes a real man to be with a real re woman in a real relationship. Pornography is none of that. 
So objectification is bad enough. It's already separating, right, the emotion from the physical. It's separating the spirit from the body, right, the psychological from the physical. And then what happens when we exaggerate that as well? We can get a tremendous pattern where the arousal template of individuals starts to be turned to the fantasy, not to the reality. And next thing you know, the physical bond that should unite and strengthen the bonding of a couple and of a marriage and across the life course ultimately is in great jeopardy because it'll never match the supranormal stimulus of pornography. And we don't even want to start to talk about, right? Pornography never ages. You ever notice that? Never gets older, right? Relationships do. We progress through real life. So we get through this pattern then that we often see this with women. Women in their early 20s are often much more likely to say that pornography is acceptable, right? I think it's largely because that's the time of life that they still most look like and feel that they fit those images. But as they progress into their 30s, their 40s, and their 50s, what happens to their acceptance level of pornography and their partner's use of pornography? It goes down further and further. The images don't look like them in fact, before long, the images start to look like their daughter, start to look more like the next generation, right, and patterns of that. But if that's what the arousal uh, template is, 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 is conditioned to and where we focus and have that type of pattern. So this objectification and unrealistic expectations puts us in this pattern of understanding the disruption of intimacy and what happens in the way that this starts to pull relationships apart. For a long time, we've understand, if you look at the top left box here, we talk about physical stimulation, right? Traditional sex ed right now will talk about the anatomy of the sexual response. It'll talk about the physiology of the sexual response, which young people need to understand, and I think it's appropriate and important for them to know how their bodies function and to understand that pattern. But the bottom left-hand box is what we really miss, is really understanding these elements of psychological stimulation, the psychology of sexual response. But to understand then that it's not just the experiences, but it's the relationships. So these patterns that pornography starts to disrupt, the emotional and physical bond, has a real way of starting to disrupt the physical outputs in a couple's intimacy, the levels of arousal that they can experience, but they also perhaps more alarmingly also start to disrupt the psychological outputs, their feeling of becoming and belonging and the intimacy that they share, which ultimately becomes a cyclical pattern in a relationship and can feed back to those foundations. So we see a pattern here where the emotional and physical bond is either strengthened and it keeps that relationship moving forward in ways that this becomes a strengthening part or it can become a stumbling block and start to go in those other directions. Now, these are the ideas, these are the concepts. What evidence do we have that this is actually happening, this is actually occurring? Let me share a few studies with you. First off, I'm gonna share a study with you that came out last winter. This was a meta-analysis study uh, done by uh, Dr. Wright at Indiana University, where he looked at pornography and its influence on relationship and sexual satisfaction. Okay? Now, as a quick primer, a meta-analysis is a study where you don't do new data collection. You analyze the data from a group of studies to kind of say, what is the overall finding that we have? In this meta-analysis, Wright looked at 50 studies. These studies involved over 50,000 participants. They came from 10 countries. They had cross-sectional data, longitudinal data, experiments across the board, looking at pornography and its connection and its link to relationship satisfaction and sexual satisfaction. And across the board, what do the studies find? A decline in satisfaction. We see people with less life satisfaction, less relationship satisfaction, and sexual satisfaction when this occurs. Right? So that's a growing body of evidence. That's a really simple conclusion. But when we back up and say that's the preponderance of evidence coming now from dozens of studies, well, we've got to give real pause. Right? And that's something that's evidence that goes beyond personal values or goes beyond someone's uh, uh, just sense of things. This is a way that we start to capture that this is not having the harmless effect on relationships that many claim that it is in our society and that we see real evidence of harm. 
Now, let me share two other studies with you that I think have been uh, very new and very novel in our understandings. These ones are important studies, too, because they involve longitudinal data, right? Not to take anybody back to a, to a fun research methods class they had years ago or, or sitting in right now. But longitudinal data is important because we're following people over time, and we can start to get a sense of causal uh, patterns. Because you can look at what's happening at the early data points and how well is it predicting what's happening at the later data points. So uh, Dr. Perry at the University of Oklahoma uh, published a study this summer looking at pornography and the breakup of relationships prior to marriage. The graph you see on the screen right now is showing you the rate of breakup over a six-year time period looking at the frequency of pornography use. So if you look at the point on the far left-hand side of the graph, you're looking at the percentage of couples that broke up when there was no pornography use in the relationship, right? As you move down that frequency spectrum, you can see the frequency of relationships disrupting and coming apart, right, as we see pornography used to more and more of a level. And again, in a longitudinal way, not just showing a link at the same time, but actually showing at the later data point greater disruption and breakup of the relationships, right? So you can spin that in two ways or understand it in two ways. The avoidance of pornography is creating more relationship permanence, right? The involvement in pornography is creating more relationship disruption. What about when we look at relationships with the depth and commitment of marriage? This one is fascinating because it literally just came out in the last few weeks. Uh, this one comes from Perry's lab as well. And underneath it, I want to show you some of his sub-analysis. So we've seen some other studies that have connected pornography to divorce rates, but we haven't had as much evidence about what the actual percentage is and some other key factors. So I actually pulled a quote out here from the study. The authors themselves say, we found that the probability of divorce roughly doubled for married Americans who began pornography use between the survey waves and that this relationship held for both men and women conversely. Okay, so we look at odds ratios there. That means literally it's twice as likely. But they even see beyond that elevated odds ratios for some subgroups too. Here's the key, and I love this piece. No one has looked at this in the way that this study did. Discontinuing pornography use between the survey waves was associated with a lower probability of divorce. There was actually a way that when pornography use was discontinued, the risk diminished and changed over that pattern. But they also went on to find that the association between pornography use and the probability of divorce was particularly strong among younger Americans. So younger marriages are more at risk. People would argue that they'd be less at risk with this being more of the modern culture. It's not the fact. For those who were less religious, many argue that the harms of pornography are only for the religiously minded who are making too big of a deal out of this, the less religious were more likely to experience the pornography effect on divorce. And for those who reported greater initial marital happiness, so even couples with very high levels of satisfaction that were doing well were impacted by this pornography use. And they controlled for a bunch of other variables and to try to isolate the effects of these variables here. The simple take-home message is we see growing, mounting evidence. These are three studies that are literally within the last 12 months that we see coming out. And they're a little bit better than two survey items asked in a young adult survey 10 years ago, right? The data is getting better. It's getting more conclusive that we're seeing these harms. We're seeing it now in longitudinal data. We're seeing it in ways that all of these concerns about what's happening to the emotional and physical bonds is actually having an effect. Let me wrap us up a little bit by sharing with you uh, some, uh, some uh, key ideas. How many of you have heard of the Gottman Institute? The Gottman Institute's well-known, right? John Gottman's research at, at Washington University, one of our leading marriage researchers for an entire generation. They wrote an open letter a few years ago to all of their users and all of their uh, people who follow them about pornography. And I think they make a very good kind of summary of what we know right now in relation to pornography and relationships. They say research on the effects of pornography use, especially one person frequently viewing pornography images online, 
shows that pornography can hurt a couple's relationship. There are many other factors about porn use that can threaten a relationship's intimacy. First, intimacy for a couple is a source of connection and communication between two people that when one person becomes accustomed to masturbating to porn, they are actually turning away from intimate interaction. Second, when watching pornography, the user is in total control of the sexual experience in contrast to normal sex in which people are sharing control with the partner. They go on to emphasize, worse still, many porn sites include violence towards women, the antithesis of intimate connection. Pornography can also lead to a decrease in relationship trust and a higher likelihood of affairs outside the relationship. Many porn sites now offer an escalation of sexual activity beyond simple view, simply viewing porn that includes actually having sex with other individuals. And their summary is, in summary, we are led to unconditionally conclude that for many reasons, pornography poses a serious threat to couple intimacy and relationship harmony. This moment calls for public discussion, and we want our readers around the world to understand what is at stake. Notice the date on that letter actually predates the three studies that I shared with you. All we've learned in the two years since this letter is the evidence is increasing and is deepening. It's this relationship understanding. It's this healthy sexuality, right, that becomes the basis for us to truly see how porn is a counterfeit and to help the rising generation see why it is counterfeit. A final quote for us here from uh, Waite and Gallagher from their landmark book, uh, The Case for Marriage, as they looked at all of the research around right, healthy sexuality and marriage relationships. They use the phrase selfless intimacy. This is what we have to for ourselves strive after and teach for a rising generation. Selfless intimacy can literally double your sexual pleasure. You get satisfaction not only from your own sexual response, but from your partners as well. Love and concern for one's partner shifts the focus away from the self in a sexual relationship and towards the other person. The selfless approach to sex, paradoxically, is far more likely to bring sexual satisfaction to both men and women. And it does this because it's in harmony with who we are. It's in harmony with our nature as whole people and what it really means to have whole relationships. None of us should be reluctant to raise our voice and to teach clearly and directly the counterfeits that pornography are. It's inherent in its nature and it counteracts the inherent nature we know of loving and full relationships. Thank you.